Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science. Wherever you are in the world, I hope you're having a happy Thanksgiving. Uh, whether you celebrate it or not, I do think Thanksgiving is an important milestone to recognize, acknowledge and celebrate in true crime. True crime is so often about um, the damage done to lives and the destruction done to people that it, it really is important to take stock of what one can be grateful for and what life one has um, to live um, given the context of what is going on in the world around us. Uh, wherever you are in the world I hope you are safe and warm and um, happy today. Um, I know it is really cold in Colorado um, the temperature is minus 9 Fahrenheit going up to 1 degree um, in Celsius that's <laughs> sorry that was Celsius um, it's 34 degrees Fahrenheit uh, going down to a minimum of 15 in Denver Colorado um, I've, I have a friend in Canada who said it's uh, the minimum there is minus 14 that's Celsius I think that's twice as cold as it's ever gotten to to where I am in the world um, temperature where I am gets to a toasty maximum of 98 today and down to 68 minimum that's Fahrenheit uh, or 37 degrees Celsius uh, up to a minimum of 20 um, so I says it's I'm sitting here in a t-shirt it's a blue sky day um, only thing that we could really do with here is rain in this episode we'll be we'll be taking the narrative further the one that we dealt with in the sentencing episode and it's basically simply taking um, one of the mysteries that surrounded the sentencing and just um, following through um, just sort of reviewing that as as it happened um, in terms of how true crime rocket science dealt with it so you may recall that um, judgment day in the watts case was thanksgiving um, last year the 19th of november and very soon thereafter there was an article in the Greeley Tribune which is really a fascinating read um, that came out just two days after the sentencing on November the 21st that article is a fascinating read uh, for many reasons um, you get some frank disclosures from the well district attorney Michael Rourke um, the article is titled about as big as it gets gravity of lifetime sentence for what's not lost in well DA so it's quite a frank um, discussion giving quite a few frank disclosures in that discussion when we go uh, when we drill down to some of them um, what's really interesting to sort of um, reflect on kind of a year later is when the uh, sentencing hearing was actually held on November 19th um, it was the first time um, the information had been presented even the presiding judge had never actually heard that information before so you know what's so amazing is that despite it being so late in the game um, you kind of had the first opportunity where the judge was going to hear the um, facts of the case was also the last opportunity the fact that there was just one hearing for everything just to be heard and decided on was was kind of I wouldn't say it was unprecedented but it was quite strange 
Um, and then around this, and this is mentioned in the article, um, there was um, the secrecy of the autopsy report. So even going into the trial, the autopsy reports were still secret. So even going into the trial, um, Watts wasn't aware of what was in the autopsy report, uh, as far as we know. Um, the media weren't aware of it. Um, and this was essential to Rourke's case. Um, he sort of admitted that they were keeping the information of the autopsy report secret until the investigation uh, was completed. Um, in September, and this is quoting from the Greeley Tribune, Rourke filed a motion to seal the autopsy report citing the potential tainting of still to be interviewed witnesses. In October, um, the Greeley Tribune actually led a coalition of media partners to sue uh, Weld County Coroner's Office to release the reports. And that was actually due to be heard in December, around about a month after that hearing. And so in a weird way, you kind of had the, um, the preliminary, pr preliminary hearing um, catch sort of everyone off guard. Um, and it was their way of jumping the gun basically um, addressing what is in the autopsy in the sentencing and then being done with it um, the language of that report is, is is pretty incredible just to read um, it says turns out Rourke and Weld County Coroner Carl Blech had a compelling reason to keep the autopsy reports under wraps as has now been widely reported, Shanann had a blood alcohol content um, of 0.128%. And um, it was actually because of this, because of the uh, blood alcohol content, that um, the autopsy was kept under wraps. So I'm not sure how many people are aware of that. You know, if you have to asked the question why was the autopsy sealed why was it held back well this is the reason because of the blood alcohol content well I think just to be clear this was the reason stated by the Weld um, district attorney and so according to the district attorney he was worried that the media would spin that information to raise suspicions about Shanann's innocence um, so, yeah, you have kind of a um, very interesting scenario where the district attorney, the prosecutor, is so conscious of the media narrative that he actually seals the autopsy because he doesn't want the media to spin things. And uh, you can make of that what you will. You can you can uh, take. Um, Rourke at his word that, that this was the only reason why they didn't want to release it or there could have been other reasons maybe um, um, maybe it goes beyond just the blood alcohol content um, and we're going to go into that in, in a little bit further detail uh, there may or may not be a clue into that just where um, Rourke talks about uh, again, reports in the media that, that um, Shanann had a blood alcohol content of um, 0 0.128 and he was worried that um, people may question what they had seen. In other words, if it had been reported in the media that Shanann's blood alcohol content was what it was based on her autopsy, people may have thought, or oh, maybe we saw her drinking. In other words, he was worried that that, that factual information could contaminate people's sort of original um, knowledge of Shanann, their original first-hand impressions of her. And so it was really to protect Shanann's integrity and to protect um, the integrity of his case, um, which was that Watts had committed the crime, not Shanann, right? <coughs> and so... Rourke says something to along the lines that um, because those reports had not been made public everyone we interviewed was certain they never saw Shanann drinking anything other than water and this is borne out in the discovery which we're going to get to um, 
another aspect just worth highlighting is that Rourke, um, although he's been a prosecutor more than 20 years, he'd only tried 13 murder cases, so that's less than one murder case on average per year, which is very little. Um, and um, he he felt that the Watts case would have been the most difficult case of his career, which I think is also interesting. I mean, I think what that's kind of admitting is that Rourke himself maybe didn't want the case to go to trial because he wasn't sure whether he would be able to win it um, based on his, I guess, his experience. I don't know. I mean, you have a similar level of, um, I don't know what the word is, lack of confidence, anxiety, concern, insecurity in the John Bonet Ramsey case where the um, district attorney in that case also didn't seem very confident of taking the case to trial. And yet, when you, if you're an outsider, you look at the amount of information gathered by um, expert um law enforcement um, uh, you know like just absolutely um, very very effective law enforcement teams you look at the discovery and the volume of it and the content of it you sort of wonder they certainly didn't um, lack resources they certainly didn't lack information so one wonders what the sort of real reason was for this um, reluctance to, to, to go to trial so just to remind you of the timeline, you had the sentencing on the 19th, which was Thanksgiving. This article came out in the Greeley Tribune on the 21st. And you know, if you weren't reading it meticulously, you may, you may have missed the part about the blood alcohol content. Um, that was the part that I seized upon um, and that which led to writing a TCRS assessment um, just two days later on November the 23rd. And the title of that was Shanann's post-mortem alcohol levels, uh, level appears abnormally high. Note the word appears. So it, it um, was the whole idea of that blog post was to investigate that whole line of questioning, I guess. And that is what true crime rocket science is all about. It's about myth busting. It's not about putting myths in place. It's not about um, trying to come up with fake scenarios. It's about dismantling fake scenarios and this was one of them. Um, was there um, a, an issue with alcohol? And this was beyond the prosecution's case. It was taking an independent view and saying what can we find out independently? What does Shanann's Facebook say? What um, what what looks likely both from a sort of ordinary evidentiary perspective, you know, like what was in the Watts family for refrigerator, you know, what was what, what c could one see in all their social media, and then what does the forensics say from the perspective of an expert? And I did that as well. I contacted a friend of mine who's a forensic scientist, and I had him review the information and that was a blog post following this one so I'm, I'm, I'm really just taking you through that narrative just on how true crime rocket science um, assessed this information and went through it um, before we get to that um, please subscribe I am very thankful for the almost 7,000 subscribers at this point um, thank you for your uh, interest thank you for your commentary uh, thank you for reading and listening um, and uh, let's get started on today's episode. So when I undertook this analysis um, it was from a perspective of not knowing an awful lot about blood alcohol content. Um, it doesn't come up an awful lot in the high profile cases I've done. Uh, it did feature to some extent in the Henry von Breda um, case where um, and, and that's an axe murderer in South Africa who um, bludgeoned his his parents, his brother and his sister with, with an axe and his sister ultimately survived but had amnesia. Um, he was convicted of the, the crimes. Um, in that particular case he actually 
admitted to drinking the night before and then he also drank I think he had a beer um, when he was sort of when 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 the, the police came to his home and then he went to I think a friend's house I think he had a beer there and so there was some question about um, the blood alcohol in his system um, I think they smelled it on his breath but they when they tested it it was um, very low so it had already worked through his system um, well in my experience um, the the drug narrative is far more important than than the alcohol narrative um, I think the drug narrative uh, is far more significant for example in the Amanda Knox Meredith Kircher case um, but you know were were drug tests done they so often aren't they weren't done in this case in the in the Chris Watts case he wasn't tested for uh, as far as we know drugs or alcohol which is kind of bizarre now I just want to deal with um, a few intertextual elements briefly just in terms of when we look at um, the whole narrative that um, Shana and this is a defense case so please think about it in that respect when we look at the whole narrative of Shanann um, being, um, how can I put it, drinking um, around the time that, that she died. So let's say theoretically on the aeroplane or um, wherever. Um, what all of that is sort of pointing to is, it, and this again is a defense, would have been a hypothetical defense case, was that she... Um, you know she was very emotional and she drank I guess and then um, and, and because she was pregnant the shows she didn't have um, she didn't have respect or whatever for her child and 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 thus um, you could see a, a precedent almost for harming her other children and even maybe harming herself um, so that was that. That's sort of the the fictitious um, scenario that that a, a, a possible defence could have come up with. Um, there are a lot of fictitious defences like that in a lot of other cases. So, in the Scott Peterson case, you have the whole thing of um, Lacey going for a walk with a dog. In the um, in the John Benet Ramsey case, you have the fictitious ransom note and the foreign faction. In the McCann case, you've got the fictitious paedophile abductors. In the Amanda Knox case, you've got the fictitious burglary. In the Stephen Avery case, you've got the fictitious um, kind of setup, you know, where the police set him up, uh, which didn't work <laughs> in that particular um, case. In the West Memphis 3 case, the reality was made out to be a fiction, so the fact of the occult was, was sort of made out to be a, f a fiction, and it worked. Um, the um, West Memphis 3 were acquitted in an Alfred plea, which is basically where they pleaded guilty and they were found um, not to be guilty. In the Tri triple X murder case with Henry von Breda, um, you had a situation of um, him claiming that two balaclava clad um, bandits, or what, what do you want to call them, um, intruders, came into the scene and they committed the murder. So, so that's the fiction there. In the Jason Roder case, which is a case of a, a married man, a sort of a business mogul, cheating on his wife at a hotel with his wife present. So his, his wife is present with him at the hotel, in sharing the hotel room, and then he wanted to sort of cheat on her um, with someone else at the hotel. And she then confronted him, his wife confronted him, they argued, he murdered her, and then he made it he made it um, appears that she committed suicide so he sort of put her body up against the back of the bathroom door and and then claimed that she she was upset that they were getting divorced and she committed suicide that's the fiction in that story in the Rebecca Zahau case the fiction is that the, almost the same thing that she was so upset about 
what she had done um, to her boyfriend's child, allowing him to fall down the stairs that she committed suicide. So all of these are fictions um, used in um, high-profile murder cases and to, to varying degrees of success. In some cases they succeed and in some cases they fail. In the Rebecca Zahar case, tragically, um, that fiction has succeeded. So I'm just comparing all of those to the um, Watts case. In the Watts case, the fiction is that Shanann um, uh, drank or, or, a bi or drank alcohol or, or something like that. Um, it's a fiction that could have been used by Watts, but Watts actually never used it. Um, would the question is, would Watts have used it if he'd known about what was in the autopsy report? And this is why I, so I don't think he did know. Um, and as far as I know, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, as far as I know, um, the blood alcohol aspect wasn't even mentioned in the sentencing. So, so Watts wouldn't even have heard it at his own trial, um, something that he could have um, you know, cottoned on to and, and used as a possible defense. Okay, so what's quite interesting with the um, sentencing hearing, I've just listened to the whole spiel again. Um, Rourke pretty much doesn't refer to the autopsy at all. He also doesn't refer very clearly to when Bella or Celeste are killed. That's just not even um, mentioned. He doesn't mention if it's before or after Shanann. He later admits in the press conference afterwards that he's not sure when it happened, um, that they're not sure of the time of death. Um, that's something True Crime Rocket Science um, sort of nailed on really, really early on. Um, but he also doesn't mention the blood alcohol in the press conference either. So it sort of cam came up in the discovery and then the Greeley Tribune sort of seized up on it and that's where it finally emerged in the media narrative. Um, and as I say, that that's also something that True Crime Rocket Science uh, wanted to assess and address. So the word alcohol features 55 times in the discovery documents. That's more than five times more than the word Lavelle, the company Shanann worked for. And because she was returning from a Lavelle conference, Lavelle actually forms part of the crime narrative. So that should give you an idea of how often or how significant the word alcohol is in terms of the discovery and in terms of the crime narrative. The word pregnant appears 78 times across the 1960 pages. So that should give you an um, idea of the, again of the uh, proportionate significance of the word alcohol 55 times relative to pregnant 78 times. Um, so, so you can you can see um, alcohol does form a fairly significant part of the trial narrative. But what um, is the significance of the alcohol exactly? Well, we're not sure, and we certainly weren't sure um, in in early um, November. Oh, sorry, not early November. In the early days after the discovery, so 23rd November. The district attorney has mentioned it as the key reason the autopsy reports were suppressed and also that the alcohol found in Shanann's remains was normal, uh, placed in inverted commas, simply as a result of ordinary decomposition. I wasn't sure that that was true. Um, although he was saying it was normal, at face value it seemed to me that the um, this figure uh, um, having you know alcohol at... Uh, um, close to twice the legal limit just seemed uh, didn't seem normal. Um, the Colorado one um, also referred to Shanann's blood alcohol content at the time of autopsy being uh, 0 0.128 grams per 100 milliliters. Um, Rourke said that this didn't indicate she had c consumed alcohol. His words were that the blood alcohol uh, is very, very consistent with human decomposition. Um, the same article refers to several substances found in Bella and Celeste's body, but all of them can be attributed to crude oil. 
At the time investigators interviewed him, Watt showed no signs of being under the influence, investigators said, so they didn't test him for drugs or alcohol. Um, and so in this particular blog post I queried this, I said very very consistent. I wasn't sure about that so I checked with a friend who works in forensic science including forensic medicine. Before I share what he told me, let's review some of what we know about alcohol references in Shanann's social media as well as the discovery documents. Now just to be clear, um, this same forensic scientist wanted to, wanted to do the same thing. So in order to assess the information, he had his forensic uh, science, so, so basically his calculations independent of the victim. And then he also had, he also needed the narrative of the victim. He needed to know where she was, what witnesses said, um, what her habits were, you know, what her kind of personality was. So he needed both to, in order to draw up um, his final analysis. And I'll provide Mollett's final analysis in a, in a follow-up episode. Um, as part of me doing my due diligence, I went through the uh, social media narrative and um, it wasn't easy, but one did find the occasional reference to Shanann saying that she needed a drink or something. Um, obviously, one reference saying I want a drink doesn't mean necessarily anything. The, the question was, um, was it pointing to anything specific? Um, and so I did find a reference um, close to August 4th which is just um, which is 14 weeks into Shanann's pregnancy and just a week before her death. Now the fact that she said she needed a stiff drink doesn't mean that she had a stiff drink. Um, but um, yeah, I mean this was simply um, asking a question and trying to find the answers. Um, on November 5th, um, so a couple of weeks even before this made it into the media narrative, I posted on Crime Rocket about Shanann's possible alcohol use in a post called Sneaky with Seltzer. And um, to be honest, the idea for that didn't even come from me. Um, a friend of mine, a reader, who um, often used Seltzer herself, simply recognized the brand in, in a social media post and alerted me to it. And that made me kind of curious about it. Um, I would like to provide more detail, but unfortunately that's been scrubbed from the internet. Um, I did provide uh, links to where Shanann, um, I think she was um, applying cleanser to her face or something like that. And while she was doing it, she was asking, sh she was obviously recording this live. She was asking what's to, to pour a glass of wine. Again, no, and this was on January the 14th, 2017. Again, none of this is um, like, it's not the end of the world, her doing it, it's simply um, putting together a, an assembly of, um, of her alcohol use. And uh, again, no one's um, kind of pointing her fingers saying, you know, um, it's, she's guilty of anything. Um, I myself had a couple of glasses of wine last night. Um, and not for social, um, for the sake of socializing, for the sake of sleeping. Um, I often have that problem, my mind gets sort of um, um, going like a machine and um, one can't simply shut it down and so I often use alcohol to, to do that. In fact, Stephen King jokes about it, he says, um, you know, someone asks him, are you alcoholic? He, and then his answer is, well, I'm a writer. <laughs> so uh, uh, that doesn't quite apply to me, but uh, you know I think we can all be honest that we all use alcohol. You know, the question here was whether Shanann's alcohol use was relevant. That's simply the question. And um, to test that relevancy, one um, went through the archive and just looked at the instances where she was using alcohol. Was she using it when she was stressed? Was she using it a lot? Was she using it not a lot? Um, and the answer did seem to be that she was using it infrequently. Um, that's also what her friends um, said and um, that does seem to be the case. 
Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I um, referred to um, specific instances in a clip, but the the, the the clip has been scrubbed. Where Shanann tells her Facebook flock that her husband, who is doing the laundry, needs to get her some wine. I can't um, provide that anymore because, as, as I said, it's been removed online. Um, are there any other photos of Shanann drinking alcohol? Um, well, there, there are very few. There, there may be less than a dozen. Um, uh, one of the images I found of her at a party um, could be white wine. Um, it's unclear what impact alcohol would have on her lupus other than a sedative effect taking the edge off and perhaps soothing the discomfort and possible interactions with her medication. People who, who do have lupus would probably be able to answer that better, but I would imagine that um, uh, alcohol is contraindicated for you know, strong um, pain medication. Uh, from the discovery documents, there's a mixed bag from her friends, with some saying she drank a few times a week, to others saying she never drank. Um, make of these testimonies what you will. According to Addy, Shanann didn't drink any alcohol whatsoever during the trips to San Diego or Arizona. Since Addy was a Thrive promoter and effectively a business part of Shanann's, I'm not sure what um, I'm not sure whether we c can place too much value in her statement. Uh, you can go through um, the references to to alcohol in Christina Meacham's. Uh, sort of testimony, but I think it's important to be aware that this was kind of a separate line of the investigation. Um, on Wednesday, October 3rd, um, Greg Zentner was specifically, um, from the CBI, was specifically asked to contact Shanann's friends to inquire about their, sh their knowledge of her alcohol consumption. So, you know, if you're going to accuse true crime rocket science of being, uh, I don't know what, um, uh, this this is a particular area of the discovery. It was a particular area of the investigation, and it's just one of the other areas that True Crime Rocket Science, one of the angles that that um, we looked at as well. Um, there's also Cassie Rosenberg's view, um, and she was quite adamant, just saying that there was no way Shanann would drink alcohol while she was pregnant. Um, to be honest, I think this resonates very strongly just, just because Shanann did seem quite strict on herself. Um, she seemed quite OCD. She seemed very regimented and scheduled and controlled about her pregnancy. Um, even her going to the doctor regularly for checkups. Um, she seemed very aware of her own health. So um, the whole alcohol thing um, seems very unlikely. Um, just just based on, on Shanann's own behavior. Um, Karen Epps said Shanann didn't drink any alcohol while she was with Shanann in Arizona. Again, um, f for me it's difficult to rely too much on what fellow thrivers would say because one can imagine they would say anything that would um, make, their, um, make themselves look good. I mean th their jobs are to be promoters. And um, I, d I just have a problem thinking that they would get out of that, take that cap off and just um, be completely clear and authentic about what is going on one way or another. I, I just don't think people whose job it is to promote a certain thing um, would be able to not promote a particular agenda um, in that way. And so in that sense, I found it a little bit difficult to know to what extent one could rely on, on this sort of thing. Um, and it sort of also raised the question, you know, who could provide this sort of information about Shanann that wasn't a thriver, you know what I mean? That, that, that wasn't part of her downline kind of thing. Um, then you also had Cindy De, De Rosset. Um, she was also at the Thrive Conference. She said she didn't see Shanann drink any alcohol. Um, in one of my very early videos, I prov provided a kind of a screen grab from that Thrive conference and um, Shanann looks like she's charging her phone but there's also um, what looks like a drink uh, in front of her. I don't think that was actually her drink. I think that was uh, um, the drink of someone on the other side of the table. It's just really far in front of her and it certainly doesn't look like alcohol, whatever it is. So even if it was her, um, her drink, I, I don't 
I don't think it was alcohol. Then you ha also had the lawyer, Hamza, uh, who Shanann met in a restaurant and he said he also didn't remember Shanann drinking any alcohol. And so in the blog post I was just saying that it seemed unanimous that all the thrivers thus far saying Shanann never touched a drop of alcohol and would never do so when pregnant. And she didn't drink at all while they were in Arizona. But um, there was one exception to this kind of sketch and that was from Nicole Atkinson. She had a slightly different story to the other thrivers. And this story was recorded by Detective uh, Baumhover. Um, on the 3rd of October he spoke to Nicole Atkinson via telephone uh, regarding the events um, f of um, on, on the evening of I think he's got the date wrong uh, he has it here as the 12th of October but I think he meant the 12th of August which would be um, uh, the 8th month um, and but anyway he was referring to while Shanann was still in Arizona and he said what time the flight was originally scheduled for, for 8 o'clock and that she, Shanann, Cindy and Addie went to dinner at approximately 5.30 which is fairly early um, and then he asked Nicole what Shanann had to eat and drink while attending the pre-flight dinner she said that Shanann ate chicken Caesar salad and drank water with lemon um, he, asked Shanann, he asked Nicole if Shanann ate or drank anything after the group dinner. She said Shanann drank only water and that she kept pushing her to drink more water because of her pregnancy. Um, Baumhover pertinently asked Nicole if Shanann may have consumed soda, beer or wine at any time, to which she replied no, because she's pregnant. Um, According to Nicole, there were different uh, appetizers at the table and Shanann may have eaten, but was adamant she drank only water with lemon that night. Um, Nicole did say that Shanann would sometimes drink something carbonated, but never a soda after she started thriving. Um, when Bormova asked Nicole if Shanann ever drank beer or wine prior to her pregnancy, this is now prior to her pregnancy, Nicole said here yeah, or there but it was very irregularly and so this is clearly an, an honest answer I mean to ask someone you know you know do you ever drink wine or beer um, I, I think it would be in most cases not accurate to say someone never ever drinks uh, because most of us do um, we also know that there were beers in the Watts refrigerator downstairs um, not sure if there was wine anywhere else in the house um, and in this respect Nicole provides some details saying she estimated that Shanann drank once or twice a month um, Nicole said Shanann kept alcoholic be beverages at the house but were used mostly for entertaining guests that sounds right and I have to say um, based on that I, I, I certainly drink a lot more than Shanann does uh, maybe most of us do um, on another subject, Nicole said Shanann called Watts at approximately um, 2300 hours um, Mountain Standard Time to inform her her flight was going to be delayed. Nicole said the phone call was very short and that Shanann told her it sounded like Watts was working out and that he didn't want to talk to her. I must say when I originally heard that I thought that what it meant was Shanann spoke to him and he kind of sounded out of breath and didn't want to talk to her um, but I don't think they, that that she was actually able to get hold of him at 2300 hours I think she called he didn't answer and then he texted her because obviously he was in on the call with Kessinger um, but there was a moment early in the in the evening I think where she did call him and and he was quite abrupt with her and then she texted him to say um, you know kind of sorry um, I'm sorry that I've disturbed you but in a kind of a sarcastic way so um, I think um, Nicole's a little bit um, maybe confused about the timing of that call um, 
she may be or, or maybe Bormhover um, just recorded it um, in a way that implies that that call was at 2300 hours when it when it was much earlier um, the the part that I was very aware of was Shanann had to have been very troubled um, because of everything that was going on she had to be troubled because of um, her health uh, and we know that Watts was sort of poisoning and her and trying to bring about a miscarriage um, but be besides that she was troubled about the possibility of an affair and I mean there was an affair going on and Shanann was worried about that she she had to have also been worried about the finances and so it would have been very human for her flying back from the conference sitting on a flight you know a flight that's delayed sitting at the airport waiting and waiting and waiting to be tempted to have a drink you know I thought that that would be more likely than not likely um, but it in a way it's putting the starting line um, uh, in line with the finish line in, in other words knowing what the autopsy results were saying um, you know you sort of making the case that she had to have consumed some alcohol and although um, I think it's 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 very normal for people in that situation to drink a drink um, it didn't necessarily mean that Shanann did um, it simply meant that she could have um, and this is what true crime rocket science wanted to establish kind of as a certainty um, so Nicole said that Shanann was emotionally distraught about her relationship with what subsequent to their visit with her family in North Carolina and this is uh, being distraught in Arizona about that visit according to Nicole Shanann was looking for advice from other friends about how to fix their relationship and that Watts talked about separation Shanann told Nicole she was shocked and didn't understand how it got to the point of separation because everything seemed fine between them before she left for a trip to North Carolina Nicole and Shanann were both reading a book named Hold Me Tight a book about building loving relationships and had a second copy sent to the house so Watts could read it as well it should be noted the second copy of the book and the shipping box was 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 located in the recycled tr uh, trash bin inside the Watts garage during a constant search of the residence I asked Nicole if she knew um, Shanann asked Watts to wake her up and when he woke her to get ready for work Nicole and Shanann told her she wasn't going to speak with Watts when she got home because she knew he'd been he'd be sleeping Shanann told Nicole she was going to put her arms around him because they hadn't been touching each other lately but nothing else that night Nicole said Shanann told her she was planning a trip to Vail for just um, herself and Watts the following weekend and that's the end of Bormover's report the detective doesn't mention whether Shanann had a drink on the three-hour flight back to Denver it's not clear who sat beside who and if Shanann did have a drink uh, whether anyone would have noticed um, that is actually addressed in the Greeley Tribune article where um, uh, the district attorney Rourke talks about the fact that they interviewed um, airplane passengers and airline employees so they went to quite a lot of effort to um, establish um, the, you know the, just the possibility did Shanann could Shanann have had a drink on that flight or not and then I found a um, an image of Shanann and I think Christina Meacham drinking glass of wine um, I think this is very shortly before or after neck surgery um, and then another just a photo of a glass of wine from Ju Ju June 22nd 2017 and one or two others um, now according to the autopsy reports there was an elevated amount of alcohol in Shanann's mildly decomposed body and so um, this is the other aspect to address which is 
besides the social media narrative and the narrative of the witnesses, the toxicology actually referred to um, you know, the blood alcohol concentration. It actually sort of came up in the toxicology report. Um, and so I then took this information and I contacted um, a friend of mine and because I was looking at the information I was saying I don't know where this gets us. I don't know what I don't know what this this 0.128 means, and um, so I spoke to this guy about it at length, um, and I said and I asked him if he he could go on the record in terms of if he could study the information and then provide me with a written statement. Now, if you know true crime rocket science. Um, I do this occasionally where it's uh, a critical area and um, but it's not something I do very often um, just because I feel like there's enough I have enough expertise in a lot of areas to deal with certain things myself in this particular area I felt like um, um, it's too scientific and I really need um, a, a, a proper expert analysis from a absolute um, expert in this particular field and um, and I, I I really wanted this guy to go on the record identify himself and and then make his assessment public whatever it was whether it was um, showing the toxicology to be normal which is what the district attorney said or to be um, not normal, which is what it seemed to be. It, it didn't seem to be be normal, and I wanted to be very transparent about what I was asking and what the answer would be. And so, um, it is also important that this guy be aware of the thrive and also the length of time of the body being where it was and the temperature of the environment and the time between burial and autopsy and, and so it became a very complicated thing and, and I do provide this guy with um, certain aspects of the discovery and we had really long long conversations talking about you know how alcohol might diffuse through various organs and you know when it breaks down you know would alcohol that one is ingested um, break down or would it accumulate like what actually happens and um, so at the time when I when I wrote this blog post on um, November 23rd this was the TCR assessment t TCRS assessment at the time which was basically what he said um, he said I doubt whether you can get that level 0 0.128 grams 100 milliliters he said maybe a 0 0.02 from 0 you only have so much bacteria in the gut that can cause fermentation so it would be very limited and I agreed 100% with that I thought you know if you imagine a dead body developing the same amount of alcohol as the legal alcohol limit and then twice that amount it just seemed like a heck of a lot of alcohol to accumulate in a cadaver from zero um, and so th that's that's what I said in the post. I actually got this wrong in the um, in the post. I concluded saying um, to get an idea of how much alcohol is involved, Shanann's post mortem alcohol levels were roughly three times the legal blood alcohol limit. That wasn't true. It was actually less than twice the amount. Um, twice the amount would have been 0 0.08 times two, which is 0. 1, 6, and it was 0 0.128 so almost 0 0.13 okay um, so uh, you can see there um, there was a little bit of um, inaccuracy in my assessment at that point already um, it was broadly accurate but um, not uh, certainly not scientific enough and so I've, I've finished this particular post saying it suggests she may have consumed four to six glasses of wine in the hours prior to a murder. And then I ended the saying, uh, further analysis pending, and I provided the alcohol volumes for um, uh, certain um, uh, 
certain beverages such as spirit coolers, cocktails, uh, shooters, and and the glass of wine. Um, the the amount of alcohol in a glass of wine is 0 0.02, uh, which is really not much. Um, and and so that was where I left it off. Um, this episode's already been almost 50 minutes long at this point, so I'm going to deal with Thomas Mollett's um, uh, forensic report in um, an episode following this. Uh, in any event, thank you for listening. Uh, if you haven't subscribed to this channel, please do. And once again, have a happy Thanksgiving.